So, my very special guest today on the Red Couch is none other than the legendary Barbadian entertainer. Uh, notice I didn't say musician, I said entertainer and music producer and writer. His name is Nicholas Branco. Welcome, Nicholas, to the Red Couch. Thank you, brother. Vic. Yes, well, now, if I was young enough, I wouldn't want to be one of your children. You see, because Nicholas Branco comes from a lineage that is really, and he has defended the lineage, and the generation before him defended it. So I would feel sorry for anybody coming right. after you. Then, of course, your dad, George Branco, right. was also a legendary attorney at law and was the clerk of the House of Parliament. Correct. Well, so correct. that kind of lineage meant that you had to you had to carve out your own uh, uh, your own space, yeah. but you also couldn't let down the name. But that is a fact. You see, the, the the beauty about being raised by my father was that while he was a stickler for excellence and he was a connoisseur of language, he was not specific about what it was that he chose to do. He was specific about how you chose to do it. His concern was that I made sure I was as good as I possibly could. The other thing I want to say is that my father was, in my mind, the most talented musician I knew, but was forced to not, to not execute that because of how my this was in the days. And I think, vicariously, my father was proud of my life. Once he worked out that I was not going to be relying on him for financial sustenance forever. <laughs> Once he worked that out, he was forever. Okay. Forever. <laughs> Once he worked that out, but up until yeah. the point that he worked that out, things were a little tense. A little tense. Yeah. 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 To be honest with you a little bit, I mean, I didn't know my grandfather well early on because he and my father had similarly strained relationships as you know how it is in the Caribbean. And so I met him later on in life and became close to him. But he also was a great connoisseur of music, classical music. He had his own thing. Because he, he used to buy me really complex books about music and theory and all kinds of shit. And I would be like, well, you know, I respect the thought, right? But that's not the direction I'm going. <laughs> you know? Um, it's me time again. Yeah. When there was a family gathering at Long Bay, when there was a family gathering or party at my house or his house, all of these people would be there and just casually speaking about things that people would not ordinarily hear about. And then, uh, invariably, my father would put on his promoter's hat and bring his artists out to perform on the piano. Uh, it was my first experience in exploitation because I would never pay it. <laughs> <laughs> I learned how to deal with promoters from that. <laughs> but it was definitely an interesting experience performing in that environment for them, you know. Um, there is no more intimidating an audience. Who were your early influencers in terms of, I know Janice Millington probably, yeah. um, as, as a teacher, yes. Yeah, well, I, um, I had difficulty finding what I would call local mentors in music early on in life. Um, the first person that really influenced me, I would say, was, was Burrata. You cannot just listen the way you like. You are listening to everything. All that time, Janice was teaching at Harrison College. So I was interfacing with her regularly. I didn't do music at Harrison College, contrary to what a lot of people think. But I was very close to her. She taught me privately. <clears throat> so she was like an, an advisor, because school life for me was a bit difficult. For the same reason that home life was great and difficult, in that my father had gone to school there. He wanted to marry with a scholarship. And 
the majority of the people that taught there were in school were him. So he was like this figure in the school and it's like, but, but Nicholas, I mean, your father was a great student. Well, what is it that you're in here doing? Tell us about some of your, now you, you've toured, you've done a lot of touring, yeah. some, of the, some of the names that you, you um, But my two main artists that I've toured with really are, well, I started my, the first tour I ever did was a world tour with Eddie, which to me is, you're kind of starting at the top in a way, because at that time he was, like he was, he and Bob Marley right. were the two yeah. most known Caribbean artists. But, and what was great about that tour is that we went to Eastern Europe. And, and in them days, you weren't getting into Eastern Europe easily. So we went to places like Yugoslavia, Hungary, Poland, you know, at the time when they were still part of the Eastern Bloc. Correct. And that was a phenomenal thing for, to see. To actually see people how they lived and you know the, the difference in social structure. Yeah. After that tour, I came back home and I started a band with Philip Forrester and Cindy Legal called Second Avenue. Second Avenue. Right. Yeah. I know just how much you and I did that for about eight years. So what that meant was that I was home and I started producing a lot of music. And it was the production part of things that kind of got me into working with international artists because I started to do work that got noticed. So I ended up working with people like uh, Maxi Priest and worked with Cindy Love on a couple of things because she had wanted to do a reggae version of Girls Just Want to Have Fun. So myself and Mikey Bennett and drummer from Jamaica, Denny, Desi Jones, who is like after Sly, but Dunbar is Desi. And we went up there and did a whole session with them. I worked with Simply Red as well, because at that time I find like, it's less so now, because I think we've lost our way in the Caribbean musically a bit. But our music was exotic and interesting, and people wanted to be a part of it, and they knew that they could not get that kind of expertise elsewhere. Even though there were Caribbean people all over the world, the people that lived in the Caribbean had a different kind of sensibility and authenticity. So we were getting opportunities to interface with musicians a lot. All around that time, Roberta was Roberta Flat was coming to Barbados. And I'd met her a couple of times. And I we had a, a pretty good relationship and she always thought about work together. We'd done some studio work together. And then one day she called me and said, listen, Nicholas, my bass player is not available for a tour. And I want to know if you're interested. And I said, well, yeah. She said, well, the tour is starting on Monday. This is Thursday, she called me. <laughs> and she said, well, I am going to FedEx you. I have already FedExed you all the CDs of all the music that I have. Your flight is tomorrow. And the rehearsal is Saturday and Sunday, and we heading out on Monday. I toured with her for 12 years. We did. We went around the world for five times. Thank you. It is. It is an honor. I want you to know that I feel special. This is the first time that like, for now I've ever interviewed me. I, I feel like I reach. A, okay, <laughs> you reach a place here. You know, for now, no interview you. All well, right. I all never realized right. I never interviewed you before. Not me. Not never. Wow. Never. That's amazing. First time. Yeah. So I feel okay, right. I reach a certain <laughs> level here now. Nicholas Franklin, thank you very much. Thank you.